You know, Easter is the best Sunday of the year to become a Christ follower. And if you're not a Christ follower, I hope that this morning you will hear something from God and that God will bring you to a place where you're ready to make a decision to be a Christ follower. If you are a Christ follower, then I rejoice with you that you are following Christ and I pray that the things that we talk about this morning will excite you about the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask Harley if he'll turn my microphone down just a little bit. Harley, are you back there? Would you turn mine down just a little bit? It's a little bit of feedback for me. We believe that Jesus literally, physically rose from the dead. You say, well, why do you believe that? I know some of you are saying, because you found it in the Bible and you believe everything that's in the Bible. Well, I do believe everything that's in the Bible, but let me tell you why we can believe this. There was a guy by the name of Matthew. He was a first century tax collector, and he followed Jesus, and he saw Jesus die, and he saw him buried, and then he saw him alive again, and he was so convinced that Jesus rose from the dead that he wrote about it. Then there was a guy by the name of Mark, and Mark either had a Greek mom and a, and a Jewish dad or a Greek dad and a Jewish mom, but Mark is his Greek name, and he hung around Jesus a little bit. He wasn't one of the disciples, and he saw Jesus alive and well. He saw Jesus buried, and he saw Jesus alive after three days in the ground, and he wrote about it. And then there was a guy by the name of Luke, and Luke is a doctor, and he, was the, um, he interviewed many people who had seen Jesus alive, who had known that Jesus was buried, and then saw Jesus alive after he had died, and after interviewing them, he became convinced that Jesus truly had risen from the dead, and he wrote about Jesus' life, and he wrote about his resurrection, and he wrote about it in chronological order. So if you want to know how things unfold in Jesus' life, read the Gospel of Luke. And then there's this guy by the name of John. And John was the first person who arrived at the tomb. Peter got there right after John and went in, but John was the first one who got there. And he found the tomb empty. And he said that he was there right at the cross when Jesus died. Matter of fact, Jesus had said to him, John, this is your mother. Take care of my mother, I meaning take care of Jesus' mom. And he said, I saw him die, and then I saw him alive three days later. And John wrote about what he knew had happened. Well, then there was a fisherman by the name of Peter. And Peter was a follower of Jesus. And he saw Jesus die, and he saw Jesus alive after three days, walking around, talking to people, and Peter wrote about it. Now, Peter died by crucifixion himself because he proclaimed that Jesus was his king and that Nero wasn't. And before he was crucified, he said, would you crucify me upside down? because I'm not worthy to be crucified the way my Lord was crucified. And Peter died by crucifixion because he knew that Jesus had risen from the dead. And then there's this guy by the name of James. Now James is the half-brother of Jesus. See, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, but Joseph and Mary had other children after Jesus was born. And one of their children was James, and James is Jesus' half-brother. And he's the primary reason why each and every one of us ought to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, because James doesn't show up on the scene until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why didn't he show up before that? Because James didn't believe 
that his brother was the Messiah. He didn't believe that his brother was the Son of God. But after, Jane, after Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to his brother James, James became convinced that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was the Son of God. And James actually wrote one of the books in the Bible. And James became a leader in the first century church. And why did that happen? Because he knew that his brother Jesus had risen from the grave. And then there's this guy by the name of Paul. Paul was a Pharisee <clears throat> who became a friend of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and, and Peter and James, but he came to the game very late. Matter of fact, after Jesus had died and risen, Paul decided he had to persecute those people and put them in prison and have their life taken. He hated anybody that was a follower of Jesus Christ. But one day he had an encounter with the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and it changed his life. He became a follower of Christ and he wrote 13 books that are, that are in the Bible. And that's why we believe. We believe because we have some eyewitnesses, people that lived when Jesus lived, were alive when Jesus died, were there when Jesus was in the grave, and were there when Jesus came out of the grave, and in some way they had seen him, they had talked with him, they had touched him, they had eaten with him, they had seen him over and over and over again after he had risen from the dead, they are first century witnesses, all proclaiming that Jesus died and rose again. Something that people don't do, but the Son of God would. All these accounts that are written about Jesus are first century accounts. They're written while people who had been there were still alive. So if the writers of these first century accounts had made a mistake or had lied about it, they would have immediately risen up and said, no, what James wrote was wrong. What John wrote was wrong. What Peter wrote, I was there. That's not what happened. But they didn't. They were supportive of what had taken place. And the third thing is this. These first century writers, these followers of Christ, these individuals who saw Christ dead and then saw him alive afterwards, all these men gave their lives because they believed in the resurrected Christ. They could have said, oh, we made it up. <laughs> I'm not willing to die for something I made up, but they didn't. They were so convinced that Jesus, who died, had risen from the dead, that they were willing to let them take their life as they proclaimed that Jesus was the Son of God. Now, it is natural to want to divorce the life and the teachings of Jesus from the resurrection of Jesus. People like every line of the story. They love hearing about his mercy. They love reading about his forgiveness. They, they love the story of Jesus with the woman at the well. They love hearing about the forgiveness that Jesus offered to the woman who was caught in adultery. They love the story of how Jesus fed 5,000 men and their women and their children with a kid's little box lunch. They love how Jesus cared for the poor people, but they say, don't make me believe that he rose from the dead. There are a lot of people who are delighted to pass on, to, or pass on the teachings of Jesus, but they still want Jesus to stay in the grave. There are some people that will say, listen, I love to rise to the morality of Jesus' life, but as long as he stays in the tomb, I, I just don't want a risen Jesus. This may be where you are today. Uh, because the resurrection 
is very difficult to swallow and to process. And some of you may say to me, you know, that's where I am right this second. I, I love hearing about Jesus. I like talking about Jesus, but I just can't handle him rising from the dead. Let me try to explain something. Everything that we know about Jesus, the sayings of Jesus, the stories about Jesus, the examples that Jesus gave us, all of those things, all of them came from men who wrote all these things and said, by the way, Jesus was crucified, he died, and he was buried, and he rose again literally bodily from the grave. Now, if you're someone who believes and loves the teachings of Jesus, but you just can't handle the resurrection, then this is what you really are thinking. You may not verbalize it, but you're thinking it. You're thinking that these people who wrote about the teachings and the sayings and the stories and the life of Jesus, that they love the teachings and the stories of Jesus. So they decided, let's get together and let's make up a story that Jesus not only did these things, but he also died a terrible death and he was buried. But let's top it off with, he rose from the dead. And if we'd say that, then people will sit back and say, wow, nobody rises from the dead, so we'll go ahead and follow this Jesus. So what you're trying to say is, <clears throat> these men made up a lie. <coughs> so if you believe that these guys wrote about the life of Christ, they wrote about all the good things that Jesus did, that they made up a lie to support their stories. And if they made up a lie, then it doesn't make any sense that we would believe anything that they wrote. The point is this. And hang on one second. Larry, would you get me a glass of water? He'll find it. It's somewhere around there. Try a shelf in the office first. The point is this. If there wasn't a resurrection, if there wasn't a bodily resurrection, you and I should abandon all things Christian. Just wipe it out. Get rid of it. If there isn't a resurrection, abandon it all. You should reject heaven because 90% of what we believe about heaven came from these men who told us that Jesus died and rose again and if they're liars, what else would they lie about? They'd probably lie about heaven, too. It would be irrational to hold on to their teachings if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. You know, we go to funerals, and I have a funeral on Thursday, and somewhere during that funeral, I'll say something like this, that this guy is okay because he's in the presence of God. He's in heaven. The problem is if Jesus didn't rise from the dead... We don't know where he is. We have no idea where he is. If you're going about doing good things, hoping that God will see you and let you into a heaven, and let you into his heaven because you're doing some of the good things that Jesus did when he walked on the earth. You're trying to imitate some of the stories that Jesus had. Just remember that what you're imitating are things that men wrote about that you really think they're lying about. Here's the point. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you need to abandon all things said about him, for they were all written by liars. Thank you, Larry. Hopefully that's going to work. Now, the idea that Jesus' teachings are good, but that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, it's been around for nearly 2,000 years. 
numerous people over the history of mankind since the death of Christ have said Jesus is a good man. And he died, but he's still dead. And I think that's why God, by God's grace, we don't just have Matthew or Mark or Luke or John or James or Peter or Paul writing about the life of Christ. We have Peter and Paul and James and John and Luke and Mark and Matthew all writing about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you have seven people that are eyewitnesses that are all writing about the same thing and writing about it in their own way and in their own words, you begin to say, wow, this guy must have died and must have risen from the dead. There are skeptics who will tell you, hey, there are people out there who are those people out there who were writing about Jesus and his life and death, they were writing two or three decades after it took place. And they may be confused. Now listen, a decade is 10 years, two decades is 20 years, three decades is 30 years. So let's um, test your memory. <clears throat> i got to sing in a second, so let me... Um, Get a lot of sip here. I don't know if I can do it now. I want you to tell me who sang this song. I wish they all could be California girls. Who? Beach the Beach Boys. How long ago was that? About 30 years ago. Okay, let me test your memory again. Who sang... That really weird song, Achy Breaky Heart. Billy Ray Cyrus, you know it immediately. Now that was like 20 plus years ago he made that famous. Now for your younger audience, now this is real testing of your memory. Who wrote the song, Black and White? It starts with an M. Michael Jackson, right. Now, guys... I could say, no way, you're wrong, you're, you're, you're confused because that was over 20 or 30 years ago that those people sang that song. And you would protest and say, wait, no, 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 we know the song. And you'll sing me one verse all the way through, perfect. You'll sound just like Michael Jackson, or you'll sing just like Billy Ray Cyrus, or you'll sound like the Beach Boys. You know something? How important was the message of those songs. <laughs> Just fun songs, right? Now, do you think for one minute a man or a woman that saw a man crucified and buried and then saw him rise again from the grave, do you think that they would be confused about that event? Not a chance. <clears throat> Paul, who wrote 13 of the books in the Bible, he says Jesus rose from the dead. But he says in 1 Corinthians 15, and you have your outline there, he says if Christ did not, has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Paul says everything we write about Everything that's in the Bible, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, everything we wrote is useless. It's worthless. Throw it away. You say, oh, Paul, wait a second, Paul. We got married, and we used one of your writings in, my, in our wedding. We actually had 1 Corinthians chapter 13 right there read for us. You know that passage, Paul, that you said love is patient and love is kind and Love is not envious and love is not jealous. That was beautiful, Paul. Thank you so much for writing that. Well, Paul would say, no, no, no. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then don't use my writings at all. Matter of fact, he says, notice in that verse it says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. 
He's talking about Matthews, Marks, Lukes, and Johns, and James, and Peter, and Pauls. He's saying all of our writings are useless if Jesus didn't come out of the grave. And then in 1515, he says this, More than that, we've been found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. So Paul says, if Jesus didn't rise, then I'm a liar. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and James, and Peter, they're all liars. Because they lie about God. So that makes us the worst kind of liars. Because we're attributing to God and saying God did this when God really didn't do that. See, what they're saying is, if there's no resurrection, then they've told you a lie about God. And they're saying God raised Christ when he didn't. And then in verse 17, he says this, And if Christ has, been, has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Your faith is futile. You say, well, wait a second, Dave. I believe that God is forgiving. How many people believe that God is forgiving? Okay, good. <clears throat> so, so I ask you, where did you get that idea? Who told you that God was forgiving? And you respond and say, well, my grandmother. She told me that God is forgiving. And I say to you, well, where did she hear about that? And you say, well, she heard about it in a sermon in her church. And I say, well, where did the preacher get his material? And you look at me and say, well, he probably got it from the Bible. And then I'll say, well, where did he get it in the Bible? And I'll say, he'll say, well, you got it from the New Testament. And then I'll look at that person and say, well, wait a second. Those books, weren't they written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Weren't they written by James and Peter and Paul? So let's get it right. If you believe that we are forgiven because your grandmother heard it from a sermon that was preached in the New Testament, that was written by men who lie about Jesus' resurrection, then your faith is futile. Why would you believe something that a man wrote that was a liar? And you say, well, wait a second. I believe that God is love. Where'd you find that out? Uh, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And who wrote that? John did. Well, John, Paul says that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, John's a liar. So why would you want to believe that God is love? You know, virtually everything we know about God is a New Testament God. Virtually everything we know and believe about heaven is found in the New Testament. If I asked you, what is God like? Your response may be, well, he's, he's full of grace, he's full of mercy, and he's full of forgiveness. Did you know that those are 100% New Testament written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Peter, and Paul, and James? And if you're going to believe these things about God, then you must believe the resurrection. If there's no resurrection, you're still in your sins. Let's make a little shift. You say, Pastor Dave, I'm going to believe, period. I say that's good that you want to believe, but what is your belief based on? And you say, well, I just believe. Gang, I've heard people say that. I just believe. I do. I just believe. Why? I don't know. I just believe. Uh, what other areas of your life do you make decisions based on, I believe. I just believe. Like, for instance, a police officer pulls you over and tells you that you were speeding. And he's going to give you a ticket. And you say to the police officer, police officer, I believe it's okay to speed if no one's on the road. Guess what you're going to get? You're going to get a ticket. 
what you believe doesn't shape reality. Reality shapes what you believe. Now let me just go back to the speeding ticket. <clears throat> if you get pulled over four times in a week for speeding, and you get four tickets, you ultimately believe that speeding, if you get caught, results in a ticket. And that is reality that's causing you to believe. But what you believe doesn't shape reality. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians. It gets a little worse. Verse 18, it says, Those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If there's no resurrection, those who have died, having followed Jesus Christ, Paul says are lost. Now, that doesn't mean that they're in hell. Uh, in my house, we have a lot of things that get lost. Keys get lost. Um, checkbooks get lost. Wallets get lost. Purses get lost. Never once did we think they went to hell. <laughs> what lost means is you don't know where they are. So if somebody who follows Jesus Christ dies, but Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you don't know where they are. Because the only reason we would believe they were in heaven is because Jesus would have died and risen from the dead and ascended into heaven and told us that that's where we were going to go after we died, if we put our trust in Jesus Christ. Here's one more thought. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If only for this life we had hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Jesus didn't rise, then those of us who are following Jesus Christ for what we can get out of it in life, we are to be pitied. For instance... You should have kept all the money that you gave this morning in the offering plate. You should have, if Jesus didn't rise. If you're in a difficult marriage and you're staying married, because you say the Bible teaches you to work it out, if Jesus didn't rise, you might as well have left a long time ago. If you save money to go on a mission trip and you sacrifice a week's vacation to go, where you serve on committees at a church or you go to church on Sunday instead of playing golf during Sunday morning, or you go to Bible studies throughout the week, Paul says, what a shame. We should have gone on a vacation. You should have gone to the seashore. You should have lived for yourself because if there is no resurrection, you might as well party now, eat, drink, and be merry because there is nothing else. But, here's the good news, verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Paul says, you've got to be kidding me. I've got the best news possible. Christ has risen from the dead. Look at chapter 15, verse 3 and following. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, which means Peter, and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, most of them who are still living. I think I'm going to just keep this up here. What Paul says is this. Jesus died to pay for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day, proving that his payment was accepted. And he was seen alive. And many of the people that saw him alive after he died are still living when Paul was writing this. And so Paul says to the people, listen, you have a lot of first-hand people out there, first-century people out there, and you have a lot of people that were first-hand 
viewers of the death and the resurrection of Christ, you ought to go look them up. You ought to let them tell their story to you. Because after you hear their story and compare it with our story, you will know for sure that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He is alive. And because he lives, our sins are forgiven. Because he lives, heaven is real. Because he lives, everything that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, James, and Peter, and Paul write about is worthwhile to read. Your hope isn't in vain. Your, your prayers aren't in vain. Your generosity, your service, your kindness, your sacrifice, your worship, your discipleship, your self-control, all the prayers that you've ever prayed for somebody that, that you love, that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, none of those things are in vain. They're all of value. Now, if you're here today and you don't believe, if you're not a Jesus person, if the whole thing that I've talked about is foreign to you, there is only one issue that really matters when it comes to your Christian faith. The issue is not how old is the earth. The issue is not what happened to the dinosaurs. The issue is not, aren't there many mistakes in the Bible? It isn't, were Adam and Eve real people? The real issue is, did Jesus die and rise again bodily from the grave? That's the only issue. And if Jesus didn't rise bodily from the grave, game over for Christianity. But if he did, it changes everything. And he says, because he rose again, our sins are forgiven. And his resurrection proves that he was the son of the living God. And payment for your sin has been accepted. If you believe that Jesus did rise from the dead, it demands a decision. It demands that you sit back and say to God, God, I'm going to follow your son Jesus. And I'll reap all the benefits. Or it means that you're going to say, gee, God, I reject your son, Jesus, and I'm willing to reap all the consequences. But you've got to make a decision. You can't be neutral. Even neutral is a decision to not accept, to not follow. Now, if you're on the edge about following Jesus, maybe sometime during this sermon, you had an aha moment. Maybe the light went on for just a minute. It just flickered a little bit. I want you to know that wasn't me. That was the Holy Spirit of God. And what the Holy Spirit of God does, was, was doing then when that light went on, the bulb flickered a little bit, the Holy Spirit was in removing the veil from your eyes. He was letting the scales fall off your eyes. He was opening your spiritual eyes. And he was encouraging you to transfer your trust to Jesus to forgive your sins. He wants you to transfer your trust to Jesus from religion. He wants you to stop trusting in being good enough. He wants you to stop trusting in your good deeds to get you into heaven. And he wants you to start trusting in his son, Jesus, to forgive your sins, to give you the righteousness of God, to qualify you for heaven, so that when this life is over, you can go directly into the presence of the Almighty God. And we're going to pray in just a minute. And if you're here and, and you believe Jesus rose from the dead, hallelujah. If you put your trust in Christ, wonderful. But maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I, I now believe that Jesus rose from the dead then we're going to pray a prayer. And all of us are going to say it out loud. And I'm going to say a line, and then all of us are going to say it out loud. And then I'll give you another line. You'll say it again. Maybe this is the first time you've ever prayed this prayer. Maybe it's the first time you've ever said to God, God, I'm ready to follow Jesus. Then I want you to pray it out loud with us at the same time. 
Let's go to prayer together. <clears throat> and remember, we're going to repeat after me. God, I believe you sent Jesus into the world to be my Savior and Lord. I believe he died for my sins. Today I transfer my faith from trusting in my good works or religion or my good intentions to trusting in Jesus as Lord. I do believe that Jesus is the Holy One from God who came to bring forgiveness of sins. So Jesus, come into my life. Make me yours forever. In Jesus' name, amen.